here right now. Um, so when you look in the mirror, you don't just see yourself. There are many hundreds of tiny not animal things inside of you. Right now, you are more tiny not animal things than human things. And these tiny things do a lot more cool stuff than your stupid, boring human things. <laughs> these things can help you eat, kill bad things, and live a long, happy life. But they don't come from you. They come from the world around you, be it your mother or who you met today. I'm interested in the fact that we can't explain well how these tiny things group together inside of you to help you grow and not be sick. It could be that the outside world controls what tiny things you think you have, or uh, what tiny things you have inside your body, such as where you are, what you eat, and who you're with. However, I believe that our own body controls how these tiny things group as one family inside of you. We can study the grouping of these things inside of animals by looking at what different tiny things are present in their body and how many of each type there are. In the past, we've seen that animals that are more different from one another have more different sets of tiny things inside of them. I use a group of not quite the same animals to question whether they live better with their own set of tiny things over a different set. When these animals are given a different set of tiny things, we see that this animal group has problems to their lives. We show that animals grow better and die less with their own set of tiny things even when they live and eat in the same place as the other animal groups. This could suggest that tiny things have body controls that decide what tiny things animals should get and that our bodies want our own tiny, not animal things over other sets. And so, thank you all for coming to this session. I took on this challenge because I believe that science communication is probably one of the biggest hurdles I've ever had to do in grad school. Uh, I, like many of you probably, have gotten trapped in this academic bubble where jargon, data speak, has basically become an effective way to communicate science. But, I pose, what good is a hammer if it only works on a small percentage of nails? Um, in this, uh, where am I? Sorry. Uh, this, these tools can't really be applied when you're talking to your handyman, the Uber Lyft driver, or in my case, my parents. Um, and all these people really need to know what I do. And I think it's important because community support of science only begins when the community actually cares and understands what we do. And so the hard part is that plain speak is very, very hard. You have to say things like not tiny, uh, not tiny animal things or body controls, but uh, but I, strongly in I uh, but I strongly encourage any other grad students here to make science communication a priority in your individual development plan. You can do K-12 outreach, set up field trips to your lab, or start a conversation in the elevator. Remember, there's only one way to Carnegie Hall, and it's not with uh, hurricanes, though they can certainly help sometimes. And so I'll finish with something I like to do when I'm very passionate about something, which is write a poem. And so this poem uh, is originally from an NIH Best blog that I've been writing. And I'll say that NIH Best is an amazing resource for people who want to look potentially in academia or outside of academia and get real world experiences of people going through the process. And so, in graduate school, our goal is science. We do our work with complete compliance. But never forget to broaden our views. The color of science has many views. Thank you.